So a while ago, I made a video demonstrating my Japanese language training program, which is available at this GitHub link. And recently I've made uh, some major changes and I want to walk through how the program now works by basically demonstrating how I use the program. The basic premise of the program is that we want to take pieces of language content, pieces of audio and video, and practice the language by systematically repeating them. So say for some episode of a podcast or an episode of a TV show, I want to keep track of which of them I'm currently repeating, how many repetitions I have left to do, and I want to be able to track all the words I encounter in those stories and drill that vocabulary. So looking at the page of an example story, here's an episode of a podcast where we have here the transcript, we have the title of the episode, we have the source it is derived from and the date which it was created, we have controls here to control the playback speed. There's also hotkeys, uh, plus and minus will allow us to also adjust the playback speed. Um, if this were a video, it would have subtitles and we could separately enable the English and Japanese subtitles if they're available. And for the player itself, there's uh, hotkeys to both pause and play. There's hotkeys for uh, jumping back and forth by a fraction of a second or by a few seconds. And there's also hotkeys for jumping to the next and previous subtitles, though in this case it's a podcast without subtitles, so there's no timestamps, and so we can't do that here. Now, on the right where you see excerpts, the idea of an excerpt is that it represents a subrange of the whole story. The idea is that for longer pieces of content, like say an episode of a TV show, uh, or for more difficult pieces of content, you really want to break it into smaller pieces. So a story starts out always with one excerpt that encompasses the full range. This is the start and end time, but I can add additional excerpts. And if I want to set the start and end time on any of these excerpts, I just set the player and then click the here, the start time of this one, and it asks for confirmation and then hit OK and see it set the start time of that excerpt to the, the mark of the player. Notice there's no rule that the excerpts can't overlap, though, of course, generally you wouldn't want them to. Uh, you can also reorder the excerpts based on the start time. So now they've been resorted based on the start time. <clears throat> That's why we have these little um, graphic identifiers that are just like random identifier graphics. What are they called? The uh, gravatars, I think GitHub calls them. Uh, yeah, so it's just to uniquely identify that excerpt and just to help you keep track of it a little better. If you want to get rid of an excerpt, you can do so. You can remove any excerpt at any time. When I play an excerpt, here, let me set the timestamp again. When I play an excerpt, it'll play... It'll play that range, not the whole media file. And if I hit vocab, it'll take me to a drill of words in that excerpt, just in that sub range. Except in this case, we don't have any timestamps on the content. We don't have any subtitles with timestamps. And so it actually is giving me, in this case, it's actually giving me all the words of the whole story, not just the excerpt. Uh, that'll be different later when we look at a video that has proper timestamped subtitles. So on the drill page, what you see is a list of words in the story. Um, you can filter them with these options on the right. So right now I have all types of words selected and then ar unarchived versus archived. Archived words are words that I've effectively dismissed from my drill set. They're words I, I no longer want to drill for whatever reason, either because I never wanted to drill them in the first place or because I'm done with it because I've mastered it or I just feel like additional drills aren't going to do me any, any good. In fact, generally I find that after I drill a word like 10 or 15 times, I find that additional drills just aren't really worth the effort. So I often will just archive it at that point. Anyway, for whatever, whatever reason, I can archive a word at any time. I can just, uh, using, a, using a hotkey, I can toggle the, the top word, the one that's highlighted. I can toggle it between archived and unarchived if I want to. In fact, this one I will archive because I know this perfectly well. Um, so when I do my drill, so there's two hotkeys, one to mark it, uh, the, the, the top word either correct or incorrect. If I mark it correct, it just goes on to the next one. Here, I'll mark a few words correct, and they just get sorted down to the bottom. If I mark a word incorrect, it gets highlighted in red and moved down to the second slot. The reason for that is because I find that if I'm having trouble with a word, I, I, I want to do a different word and then immediately come back to the one that was giving me trouble. I find that kind of immediate re uh, reinforcement is actually pretty effective. So that's why it just moves down a slot. Um, so in fact, what will happen is, let's say I get this one wrong too. Um, if I just hit him wrong, 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 it just effectively toggles between the top two until I eventually get one of them right. Anyway, so if, moving on, like if I mark a few words wrong and then get through the, like here, I'm at the last word. If I, once I mark this correct, it'll take all the words I've gotten wrong, reshuffle them and have me do another round. So in fact, yeah, like the, the, the way this works is that it just keeps doing another round of the ones you got wrong until eventually you get them all right. And then you're done with the drill. It says drill complete. 
And the reason you want to do those additional drowns is because it just gives, again, gives you immediate reinforcement of the ones that are giving you trouble. Now, once I'm done with the drill, I will hit this button, log the answered words. And what that will do, well, normally it would increment the rep count in all the words. You see, they all have a rep count. Here, I'll actually refresh the page to make it more clear. They have this rep count that just gets incremented every time you log a word that you've answered. Um, in that case, though, it told me that the words were on cooldown because I had already logged all of these words within the last uh, within the last uh, 18 hours within the cooldown window. So it doesn't let me log them again. Yeah, so the, the significance of this rep count is really just for your own record keeping, your own purposes. It's like keeping track of, well, how often have I, how many times have I drilled this word? Uh, again, with the idea that eventually once you get to like 10 or 15 drills, you probably at that point want to dismiss it from your drills, even if you haven't yet uh, mastered the word, because additional drills probably just aren't really going to do you all that much good anyway. Going back now to the story page, the question then is, well, when should you actually drill the words of a story. And I find you want to do the vocab drill before each repetition of the story. That's when you want to do the vocab drilling. So in older versions of the program, um, I had a more elaborate scheme, some kind of like space repetition system to keep track of uh, when words are due to be drilled. But now all that's gone because now the vocabulary drilling, the idea is it's tied to whatever stories you're repeating. You really only want to drill words that are in the stories you're currently repeating is the idea. So the question then is how do you keep track of the stories that you're currently repeating? And the answer is that each excerpt of a story, not the story itself, but each excerpt has a queue of reps. You can queue up any number of reps for an ex for each excerpt here. So I just hit this plus button to add additional queued reps. Normally I will do four. I find four is a good average for a story uh, or rather per excerpt because it's enough repetition to have impact, um, but it's also not too many repetitions uh, that I'm going to get totally bored. And, you know, if you get bored, the problem, of course, is you're going to start tuning things out. You're not going to really be paying attention. And so that's not good. It's not actually doing much. It, it's well, it's both boring and it's not actually very effective. So I find four is generally a good average. Of course, you're free to just adjust that um, on a whim as you as you see fit. If I decide I don't want to do so many reps, I can just remove reps at any time. But once when I do a rep, when I go through the actual story and I want to note that I've done the repetition, I hit this log button. So I hit log here and that's for confirmation. And it says, aha, you just completed a rep uh, for this excerpt and it removed one of the reps from the queue. If I try and log immediately after, it won't let me because it says uh, there's already been a log within the, the cooldown window. So that's most everything you need to know about how to work with an individual story in the program. But if we go now to the homepage, you can see here at the top stories with queued reps, these are all the stories that currently have at least one excerpt, which has at least one queued rep. Recent stories, this is a list of stories uh, that have a rep logged within the last two weeks, but which don't currently have a queued rep. Um, this is useful sometimes because what will happen is you'll do the last rep of a story and then you'll lose track of it. So it's nice if you can just see the stories you've recently done here in this list. Uh, and then at the bottom of the story catalog, this is the complete list of all the stories uh, that are currently imported into the program. Uh, so we go to the import page here. So the stories that you import are organized into sources where a source is just, well, it's just a set of stories really. Um, so here I have, for example, I have some sources which are uh, podcasts and then the other are episodes from TV shows. I think in this case, all, all episodes from, from anime. And the way you set up a source for importing is inside the, the directory of the program, there's a subdirectory called static. And inside that there's a subdirectory called sources. And inside that is where you add your own directories, one for each source. And inside each source directory, you add the audio and video files for the various stories that make up that source. And if I have say a video named foo.mp4 and I want to add subtitles, then I need to add a, a foo.en.vtt and a foo.ja.vtt for the English and Japanese subtitles respectively. So once you have your source set up, you then come to this page, refresh, and it should be listed as one of the sources and you can hit import and it'll uh, add all the stories from that source into the database. And in fact, after you've already imported a source, if you add new stories and or modify the existing, uh, the, the existing subtitles, you can re-import it and it'll update with the new stories and the updated subtitles. Okay, so last thing, let's look at a story which is a piece of video. So here we have an episode of an anime and I have both English and Japanese subtitles. I can separately enable and disable them. I'll leave them both enabled for now. Uh, so one actual important thing is you need to be able to 
adjust the timings of the subtitles because of you know how how the video might get sourced and the subtitles might get sourced they aren't necessarily from the same source and so they don't necessarily line up so i find in many cases i need to adjust the timings so the keys for that are alt minus and alt plus will just shift the the uh, all of the subtitles in the whole story by um, let's see 0.2 seconds it'll shift shift them forward and back by 0.2 seconds uh it only affects the subtitles that are currently enabled. So if I have both disabled, it wouldn't affect either. If I had just English subtitles enabled, it would only affect the English subtitles. So generally I find I have to, when I do these adjustments, I have to separately do the English and the, from the Japanese uh, to adjust these timings. And then the other two hotkeys you'll sometimes need is that uh, alt right square bracket will adjust all the subtitles after the current timestamp. It'll shove them back 10 seconds. So you're, you're making space and then alt left angle bracket will bring all the subtitles after the current timestamp it'll bring them forward to the current timestamp so th this is what you use when you need to like if, if the the gaps between subtitles are wrong in some places because of like discrepancies in the between the the sourcing of the the video and the and the subtitles or for whatever reason um it's, it's sometimes necessary to do this now understand when you make these adjustments to the subtitles when you're when you're modifying the subtitles it is actually modifying the original uh, subtitle file so just keep that in mind if you want to make sure you don't mess up your subtitles. And actually, well, very last thing, I did mention this before, you can, if you have subtitles, you can hit N to advance to the next subtitle, jump to the next subtitle, and B to jump back to the prior one. And that also can be quite handy. Actually, one thing I forgot to demonstrate is if we go back to uh, one of the anime episodes that is split into excerpts, if I click here on vocab, because it's drawing words from the subtitles that have timestamps, it is actually only giving you the words uh, within that sub range, within that excerpt. Uh, and I find that's particularly important with anime because very often anime, it's, you know, it's native content. It's going to contain a lot of new words that are new to me or unfamiliar. And so it's much more important that when I do my drills, I'm, I'm drilling a smaller subset of vocabulary at a time. Uh, also, you're probably wondering, well, wait a minute on the story page, unlike the vocab page on the vocab page, you, in the top word, you see the definitions on the left from the dictionary. And if it has kanji, you'll see also the information about the kanji, but you don't get that information on the story page, not, not in the program. Well, actually a key reason that I made this program as a web application is because I wanted to just simply leverage the 1010 uh, Japanese reader plugin, which is available for both Chrome and, and Firefox. And what that plugin does is if you just hover over any Japanese text, it'll just uh, give you definitions and, and give you the kanji information if, there, if, there, if there's kanji. Uh, and so, in fact, you can just hover over the subtitles themselves and, and get information about the words and the kanji that way. And this is by far the fastest way to look stuff up. Um, in an earlier version, I had an ability to click on words and get a definition from the program, but I just found that was kind of redundant and I never even used it anyway. So I strongly, strongly recommend that uh, even if you're not going to use this program, you should get the 1010 reader plugin. So that's pretty much everything I think you need to know about how the program works to get it running on your system. Uh, here are the instructions. So if you're on Windows, you can just clone the repo and then you should find that the executable should just work uh, and that'll start the server and then you'll go in your browser to localhost 8080. If you're on some other platform, I don't have pre-built uh, executables, so you'll just have to build it yourself. Just make sure you have Go installed and then from the command line, you switch into the app directory. Uh, you, you may have to install the, the essential build tools uh, on your Linux distribution in some cases. Uh, and then you just, go get, go build, and that should make the executable. So that's really everything about the program, but I have in the root directory here, final, final thoughts. I have these two markdown files uh, that I wrote. This first one here is some advice about dealing with the writing system. So if you're new to Japanese, I, I recommend you read this. It has some basic information you need to know and some advice about how to go about learning uh, the writing system, in particular, of course, the, 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 the kanji. And uh, I won't go through it all here, but um, I'll, I'll just summarize the most important thing, which is I personally, I think, made a mistake spending like first several months, like wasting too much time on drilling kanji itself. I, the, the thought that I had going in was that, well, okay, if I, through brute force, learn all the kanji up front, then when it comes time to real deal with the actual language, uh, it'll be a lot easier because I'll already be comfortable with, with the kanji themselves. Um, but what I found in practice is that once you learn your first 200 or 300 kanji through drilling, the problem is you start seeing a lot of characters that look very, very similar. And what's going to happen is no matter how much you drill them, unmoored from any real like meaningful context, it's going to be really, really difficult to disambiguate them, like to get get straight 
which of two or three kanji look very similar, which one is which. It just, it just gets very, very difficult at a certain point. And it turns out, actually, I found later, is that when you focus on the language itself and vocabulary, it turns out most of the time you recognize kanji. You don't have to recognize all the details of the character. In practice, when you recognize a word, you're recognizing it because there's more than one kanji in the word and you recognize the combination of them. Uh, or like in verbs, you recognize the, the kanji in combination with the kotagana that go with it. Uh, and that is what actually clues you in and, and makes it easy, you know, what, what gets you through. Now, of course, ultimately, if you want to write the language by hand, if that's something you actually really care about, um, you eventually do need to know for like a thousand to, you know, 1500 or so kanji, you do need to memorize the exact detail of, of how they're written. But to just read Japanese, you can in many, many cases get by with having a kind of vague, vague-ish recollection. Like it's not super important to memorize every stroke of every character. Anyway, so I recommend, um, you yeah, know, reading this document if if you're new to the language in particular. Uh, also, I have this other document just with general thoughts about input, meaning stories using comprehensible input as as uh, the primary way to practice the language. Um, and in particular, I, I won't go through everything here either, but uh, notes about actually TV and movies in particular. So I, I did show you an episode of anime I have in my program. Uh, I think this is really important because it, it is a debated topic of how useful is it to, to use anime at all or, or TV shows in general or movies. And well, I think you just have to be careful. Like it, it actually highly varies on which anime in particular you're talking about. So the problems you're gonna run into is, is listed here. You're gonna have uh, in, in, in so-called native content and content designed for native speakers, not really for people learning the language. You're gonna have it in many cases, uh, a lot of expansive vocabulary beyond like the basic set. There's gonna be a lot of advanced grammar, complex sentence structures, a lot of slang and colloquial speech. Accents and speech quirks, like I don't know, cat girls talking, you know, talking in cat speech, um, archaic and formal speech, shouting, whispering, murmuring, mumbling, crosstalk, loud music and sound effects over dialogue. So, like those last three, especially, you get in a lot of um, action shows. You know, if you if it's an action show and there's a lot of fighting, if it's constant fighting, like that's maybe not the best kind of anime to try and use to learn the language. So, so actually, one conclusion here is that you you really shouldn't necessarily gravitate towards your favorite kind of anime, like, or, or favorite content, TV content in general. In fact, there surprisingly is kind of an inverse relationship between the quality of a show and how appropriate it is for learners. So say going back to the uh, anime episode I was showing you earlier, well, it's actually not a terrible show. I actually think it's fairly decent. The the protagonist is pretty amusing, but by, by the standard of, uh, by the standard of junkies, the guy, it's actually pretty good. Um, but it has a number of things going for it because there's actually there's not much fighting. The characters generally are speaking very calmly and at a regular pace, not a lot of crosstalk. There's not too much action with, you know, uh, music and sound effects drowning out the dialogue um, because it is relatively cheaply animated. You can generally tell if, if the show is cheaply animated and you, it doesn't have a big animation budget, it tends to also be the case that the voice acting is a bunch of voice actors kind of just taking turns and doing rather relatively perfunctory kind of voice, uh, delivery of their lines. But that's actually good for you because it tends to make their, their speech more understandable. Um, yeah, another key thing you don't have here is you don't have characters that speak in really in weird ways. You don't have too many, um, like, like a lot of male characters that, that are gruff, uh, like, like tough guy characters. They're often very difficult to understand and there's not many of those guys in this, in this show. Um, but then in other cases, like, uh, so, so this show kind of a similar deal. This is like a, just a romance show. And in some ways this is pretty good, but then actually what I found is in the first few episodes, there's a lot of, uh, you know, so-called humble and honorific speech, which is not something I have much exposure to. So it's actually been a little difficult for me to go through the show. Um, and the show is kind of inoffensive. It's not, it's not the sort of thing I would watch under normal circumstances, but like it's, it's perfectly inoffensive actually. But then you have other things like, uh, this show. So, so this show is like total trash tier isekai. Um, I, I, I tried using this one because it has, well, it has, as, as I described earlier, it has a lot of characters that speak very calmly and take their turns. I think it's aimed for a younger audience. And so they generally speak very relatively, uh, simple sentences and stick to relatively simple vocabulary relatively. But on the other hand, well, the show itself is terrible. Uh, but aside from all that, the, the, the show does have a few problems in terms of, for, from a learning perspective, because, uh, this character here, for example, she speaks in a bit of a non-standard way. She, she does improper polite forms when she speaks. She just text tests it on everything instead of using actual polite verbs. And then you have this, uh, this annoying character who speaks in 
well, good thing she doesn't, she doesn't have many lines of dialogue, so it's actually not a big problem. Uh, and then you also have, oh yeah, so so this guy, this this old guy here, um, he, he's an example of of the kind of tough guy speech I was talking about. That's very difficult to understand. Uh, also, he's an old guy, so it's actually a combination of two of the worst things. They're often the hardest people to understand as old guys and tough guys, and he's both. Anyway, so uh, my point is that if you're still at a beginner intermediate level, you need to be pretty careful about what kind of uh, anime content you you use because you're going to have a much better time with some compared to others. Okay, so that's everything. And here again is that URL for the GitHub repo.